Hi, my name is David Dijak, Executive Director of the National Environmental Health Association. I have a favor to ask each of us as we plan the journey forward in climate and health. That favor is for you to ask yourself if there is a strategic opportunity that's been created by the chaos and disruption associated with COVID-19. Are there new partners, new ways of thinking, and new technologies which might aid us in our joint effort as we adapt, mitigate, and innovate to a better world, a world where every child can reach their full potential free from the harm associated with a rapidly changing climate. I hope everyone has a great conference. When I first got here, I used to go fishing down on the other end. And I ran up on this little small spit of land. So I thought I'd fish while I was there, you know, and I started catching trout. I said, man, this is something. I got to remember this place. So every year I would come back and every year it was a little smaller. And about the third or fourth year I went back, I couldn't find it. It was gone. If left unchecked, I would say in 20 years, this island will be abandoned. You have to leave here. There was a presentation being made down at the levee board meeting. The proposal was oyster blocks made out of rebar. And I've been a welder all my life. And so I volunteered to do the job. The way these things are designed, they, they, they rebuild land. The wave action brings in sand and these things retain it. And it's happening, and the land is building up behind these things, and it's like it's going to give us 20 feet more land for a quarter of a mile. And that's pretty substantial when you live on a seven-mile island with 1,500 people. By simply placing these oyster reefs out front of it, oh man, there's nothing like it. <laughs>everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Rebecca Rear, Director of the Climate for Health Program at Eco America, with a special announcement. Today, as part of the American Climate Leadership Summit, we are pleased to announce the Social Climate Leadership Group, formed by 17 national organizations to build understanding and coordinate action to address the mental health aspects of climate change. We need to talk about, act on, and prioritize mental health in ways that speak to new and compounding challenges posed by climate change, the vital issue of our time. The Social Climate Leadership Group looks forward to joining with others to foster this focus and innovation to meet increasing demands on the mental health system and to do so in ways that attend to long-standing gaps and inequities in mental health care and in the role of mental health in bettering the places we live. Find the full list of inaugural signatories and goals of the Social Climate Leadership Group in a recent post on ecoamerica.org. Help us amplify this announcement on social media and in the press. We look forward to working with you on this important initiative. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, Rebecca. That's very exciting. And uh, we've saved the best for last year. I do want to edit the title a little bit. It's 67 days until the election, not 60, but who's counting? Uh, everybody on both sides of the aisle agrees that this election will be critical to the future of climate solutions in America and beyond. And we've got a great panel here to help inspire and empower all of us to question candidates, to plan your vote, to vote, and to urge your fellow citizens to register and vote for climate action too. I have the honor of introducing fellow Phil Sharp. Phil is Eco America's board chair and a very good friend, and he will be leading this session. He knows as much about climate, energy, politics, and policy as any of us, having served 10 terms in the U.S. Congress. And amidst that, uh, he chaired the House Energy Committee. Since stepping out of politics, he's been heavily involved in moving civil society to climate action in a number of roles, including board member and chair of the Energy Foundation and director of Harvard's Institute of Politics. So Lindsay, Michelle, and Paul, welcome. Thank you very, very much, and please have at it. Well, thank you, Bob. And, and on behalf of the Board of Directors, I certainly want, all of us want to thank you and Megan and, and all the folks that have made this summit possible and who do the hard work on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, I must say, all of us on the board have been so impressed uh, with the 
the folks that you have brought in to partner with in the faith community, in the health community, and some community leaders as well. And uh, uh, this is really how we are going to accomplish great things in this country and around the globe. Well, let me quickly say that this is the last session. And so I just want to very quickly remind us that we've had a number of themes that have been very prominent throughout this summit in case uh, not everybody's obviously had a chance to uh, watch every session. But obviously, the first and foremost is the magnitude and, and the uh, urgency of the, the globe of the climate challenge has been front and center. And also a focus on what kind of actions, strong actions are needed in every part of our society, frankly, and, and also around the globe. But I think very important has been the emphasis on the folks that are impacted by the climate or by the policy choices that we make. Many are, are in a position where they, they bear an unfair burden. And so fairness and environmental justice has been front and center as it should be. And as the senators earlier today said, it has become finally uh, in the march forward on climate change. It's also very important to recognize that lots of things are happening, happening by corporations, by universities, by individuals, by activists, by local governments, uh, by international governments all around the world. Uh, and we, we don't want to disparage those efforts at all in, in, as our, in our march forward. And to recognize, I'm sure many online have been helping to lead that or take individual actions themselves for which we all want to be grateful. Well, this session is designed to return to that, that point of view, that, that central theme that each of us can do something. Each of us matters, each of us can make a difference. And whether it's, it's small things, small things add up when millions of people do them, but we can also push others, we can push industry, we can push the government uh, to move and do big things. Uh, and uh, we want to do this. And as I, uh, <laughs> excuse me for using, I want to march <laughs> uh, together uh, on this uh, proposition. Earlier today, we heard about organizing and leading, in a sense, from the top down. The two senators, if you heard them, are very articulate, very skilled, and they have learned how to do their jobs better in that process. Well, today, what we're going to focus on in this session is building from the bottom up, not the bottom, but where the real people are, uh, with organizations of uh, uh, people that are bringing together grassroots uh, to, to make a difference on this. Now, I need to indicate a, a specific caveat. As people know, we are a C3 organization, which means our tax status is we're a charity, and we do not endorse political candidates, and we do not uh, advertise which ones are better than others uh, proposition. Uh, and so I will not be mentioning uh, anybody running for president or any other uh, thing in order to abide by that. But I can't resist being very clear if it's not already that um, that this this old geezer has never seen such an election of such stark choices and such importance uh, proposition. Well, let me do this. Let me turn to our panelists who are what we really want to hear from uh, today. And as I think everybody knows, we have fuller bios biographies online that you can see. Um, and um, what we have, uh, but here we have Lindsay Harper, uh, who is a National Corps Support Team Coordinator with Arm and Arm. We have Michelle Dietrich, uh, who's chair of the DNC Environment and the Climate Council. Uh, and these two are people who are on the ground have been uh, organizing and, and quite experienced. So let me turn first to uh, Michelle Dietrich. I think, Michelle, you have some additional data like uh, we've been putting out today about uh, uh, voters and, and how this system works. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Phil. And it's a real pleasure to be here with Lindsay who does such amazing work. And thank you to EcoWatch and the organizers of this American Climate Leadership Summit. Um, I will be presenting some data, but a little background first. You've already heard over the last three weeks um, and in the fantastic sessions from guest speakers earlier today, uh, the election is in just 68 days and it's a big moment for climate change. You've also heard that while climate change and environmental degradation impacts all of us, it impacts frontline communities, communities of color, black, brown, and indigenous and under-resourced uh, disproportionately. 
Um, and not only does it impact these communities more, but elected officials in the past have used climate events, including but not limited to massive hurricanes, such as the one that is now tragically um, hitting the Southeast, um, and to disenfranchise frontline voters, to take away their power to demand change. Um, they've used emergency declarations to forcibly displace voters and close polling places um, in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. And they don't reverse the changes once that's over. So it happened in 2007, 2012, um, 2017, and also in 2019. And it's likely to be happening right now or very, very soon. So it's something we really need to watch and be aware of and to fight. And, and that really, to me, brings home why the focus of this particular session is so important. Um, there are so many things that can suppress the vote or put barriers in its place. The COVID crisis, mail delays, um, poll disruptions, and they will impact climate voters. They will impact the people most affected by the climate crisis and other environmental issues. And it could affect results up and down the ballot. But the good news is there's a lot that we can do to fight this. Um, it's up to all of us to speak up and fight and to fight for the air that we can safely breathe and water that we can drink, um, good green jobs so we can support our families um, and ensure our government takes the lead on all of us and that the U.S. does its fair share on emissions reductions. I was so glad to hear earlier speakers talk about that the U.S. like coming up to the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement are not enough. We need, that is now been shown by current science and current climate reality to be inadequate to prevent climate, the climate crisis we're already living in. So, um, but also means ensuring we advocate with our state and local governments to lead. So that's the work the new DNC Environment and um, Climate Crisis Council is doing. And I'm proud we've launched our work with um, a month long national listening tour, talking to people in their communities, in their states, finding out what the climate issues are and then creating a set of policy recommendations based on what people said they needed from the federal government to address the issues in their local communities. That's the kind of policy framework that I believe that we need. We've got a coalition of 170 plus supporting organizations, 30,000 people in support. And we're gonna keep working to ensure that these grassroots up policy recommendations on climate, environmental justice, and just transition issues are adopted. So to do that, we've gotta help elect candidates who get it, candidates willing to step up and fight for these critical changes. We need to pass ballot initiatives. Um, I'll talk a little more about that later and to fight at the podium and the ballot box. Um, so the good news is, as we've heard in prior sessions, but I've got a little bit of different data to quickly share, um, climate change is a winning issue among voters. Um, the data I'm sharing right now is from July 2020. It's recent, from Data for Progress. And it shows that what our national listening session found is really confirms that. When polled, 56% of all voters say they'd be more likely to support a candidate who backs clean energy. I can vouch for this as someone who won against a three-term incumbent in a purple district by campaigning in large part on environmental issues. Um, and this sentiment, you know, um, going to our next slide, it holds true for young voters, which probably doesn't surprise you. But if you look at the left-hand circle there, it's also true for older voters. Um, they're more likely to vote for someone who is pledging to get to clean 100% clean energy by 2035. And just quickly going to our next slide. Um, and one of the points of this is that these little pie charts, they all look so much alike, old, young, independents and Republicans. 42% um, of independents, 42% uh, of Republicans more likely to vote for someone who is about making sure that we get to clean energy by 2035. That's huge. And it's also especially true for key demographic groups, Latino, Latinx, and in swing states like Michigan, Arizona, it holds true. So um, I'm looking forward to this discussion and um, with, to hearing what Lindsay has to say about her amazing work. Well, thank you, uh, Michelle. Let's turn to Lindsay and uh, hear about that, uh, the work that she's been doing. She's done many things prior to Arm in Arm, but tell us, uh, Lindsay. Well, thank you, Phil, and thank you, Michelle. Um, I, I'm very appreciative of this opportunity to share some information about um, Arm in Arm. So. Um, these moments that we are finding ourselves in um, right now 
are many scenarios that communities have been experiencing for generations. Living at the margins, living in the intersections, on the front lines of socioeconomic, political, civil, and environmental harm, and extreme weather events. And just like the ones that are going on right now in the Gulf South. And so there is no going back to the way things used to be. This is our moment. We are ready and we are poised. And this is a winning movement. This is something that we can win. I want to introduce you all to Arm in Arm. It is a decentralized bottom-up climate movement that centers racial and economic justice and reflects the diversity of the United States. And it is hosted by the US Climate Action Network. About a year and a half ago, US CAN recruited about 15 individuals representing uh, member organizations of the US Climate Action Network. Uh, network. And you know, we came together, I was one of them. We studied movements, we studied the most successful elements of movements and some of the non-successful elements of movements and how we got to this moment. And most importantly, what was needed in this moment around climate and arm in arm was first. So before COVID, um, our economy left the majority of us vulnerable to harm. Uh, profits over people, ultimately the devaluation of human life, is and has been the law of the land. And the first real energy system in this country was the black body. And systemic racism is the greatest virus that has been sickening our country. Um, and this idea of profits over people leaves all of us behind in some way, because you can see where we are today. Uh, these current, again, these movements, these moments that we're living through, the COVID pandemic, the economic downturn of historic proportions, and racial injustices just don't seem to cease. They just seem to be happening with more and more frequency. These are the challenges that Arm in Arm was created to address. We launched Arm in Arm earlier this year and got a stress test in real time. Um, you know, we can only move forward and force the change that is needed to stay alive and to thrive. We have to do it together and we have to do it so that no one is left behind. The Arm in Arm Grand Strategic Objective is to unite, to ignite a transformational era that ends the climate crisis centering economic and racial justice. Um, Arm in Arm, I feel, you know, is really, is looking to achieve two really important things. We're looking to move 3.5% of the population um, or around 11 million people to scale um, to the win. That is the magic number. If you can move 3.5% of the population, you can change the political uh, landscape of a place. Um, we're looking to do this through, um, you know, providing a need in your community providing a need someone has, and then really starting a much needed conversation as to why the systems we have now are inadequate and are not serving people. We're gonna be looking to scale to that 3.5% of the American population through acts of uh, disruptive humanitarianism and sustained acts of civil disobedience. Um, the idea is that um, you are really banking on the fact that those in power will have an inappropriate response to your act of compassion. I'll share with you a brief example. If folks are familiar with the idea of, of a, um, a food desert. If you have a food desert where there are no, there's no access to healthy, fresh food in an area, you see a blank lot, open lot, you can plant food in it. You are again, banking on the fact that those in power will come and say that you can't do that. Well, now you're going to force a conversation as to why is it that we cannot plant food in a place where there is no food and there is no place to buy food and there are no plans for food and how is this an illegal situation? Are you looking to get people off of the sidelines and get people to choose a side? Really looking to draw a line in the sand. That is the place where we have, that's where we are right now. As you said, Phil, we have two very stark choices. So now is not the time to be on the sidelines. And the other really important part of this is to get people trained. People know that things are not going right, but people may not necessarily understand why. And so Arm in Arm has training to help people connect those dots um, and understand how we got to this climate moment and how to win. Um, 
I would say that, you know, again, currently our systems don't serve really any of us the way that they could or should. And they especially don't service um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. You all may or may not have heard of the term BIPOC. You will probably hear that more going forward. That's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and so, you know, again, we're looking to get people off of the sidelines. And so, at the end of the day, arm in arm is a capacity building mechanism to help people connect the dots on the climate crisis and plug in. And so please think about joining us um, as you're thinking about what to do in the next 60 days and beyond. Lindsay, uh, thank you. It's obviously compelling what you folks are doing uh, and, uh, and wish you all the success in the world. Uh, let me uh, just, uh, the first lady, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the former first lady, Michelle Obama last week in a spectacular uh, speech reminded us of how each vote can really make a difference in the outcome of elections. And she indicated, and I believe your state, Michelle, last time around that two votes at each polling place would have changed the outcome in the presidential election. And, uh, and so while we know this is often the case at lower level or, or at local uh, elections, uh, this is really compelling. But I'm assuming since most of the people that are watching have indicated by the poll that they are already ready to vote, uh, they may not need exact instruction on how to do it, but let's, uh, let's bring forth how they can help others uh, or themselves make sure they can vote. Uh, where can they get information or how can they be involved? And by the way, both of you are in states that the national media and everybody that both parties are going to be really focused on. That does not mean the vote does not matter in other states. <laughs> and by the way, people in other states, as I think either one of the senators said today, can take action in these states. But let's go to the, let's go to the how can I as an individual or, or a group help make this vote happen? Um, maybe we'll start with you, Michelle, and then we'll, we'll turn back to Lindsay. Um, yeah, this is something I think about a lot. Um, I was listening to the earlier session with Environmental Voter Project's Nathaniel Skinner and with Selena Lake, who had both a lot of really important thoughts about the issue of turnout among environmental voters, voters who identify environment and climate as among their top issues. And in previous um, presidential election years, they, they we have, um, I voted, but, but have voted at lower rates than other registered voters. So I think one of the things we really need to think about is how we reduce barriers to voting and reduce voter suppression, and also speak to that um, sense of commitment to voting that they talked about. So leading up to election day, and Lindsay, I invite you to jump in. Like, I know it's hard on Zoom, but please feel free to, you know, I don't know wave your hand or, um, but, we do need to create um, a sense of excitement and of being part of a movement. I love what Lindsay said about this is something we can win, we can do, we can we can save the planet, um, we can elect clim um, climate champions. So how do you do that specifically? So yes, I imagine everyone who's watching is planning to vote, but we can help others to vote. And we can do that, um, there are things we know work helping people to make a voting plan. We know that the people make a plan and commit to it, uh, especially in writing, but even just verbally, they're more likely to follow through. I think that's especially true in this time of COVID um, and with climate events getting in the way. Things have changed, the ways that we vote have changed. Um, we can share information about registering to vote. Um, www.vote.org um, is, um, a wonderful, wonderful nonpartisan organization. Um, and you can go there and get information on how to vote by mail or in person. Um, you wanna get more ambitious, you could host, um, we've got one of these coming up in Michigan, host an early mail or virtual get out the vote event to help create that sense of excitement and urge people to vote early by mail or in person. Um, and reminding people that because of mail delays, that early voting should happen really early, especially in states like Michigan, where your postmark doesn't matter. Your ballot actually has to arrive by election day. Not true in all states, but in some states it is, and we need to make people aware. Um, contact your local League of Women Voters, Indivisible, Women's March, Sunrise, Political Party. 
um, or your local county government to get for resources or to get involved, um, learning how to help others register to vote, especially those with higher barriers to voting, like incarcerated individuals in states where they can vote, people experiencing homelessness, college students, crucial for that climate vote, people with disabilities, ex-felons, um, people in communities where um, we have not just food deserts, but voting deserts where they have to travel two or three times as far to vote as people in other communities. And guess what? Those are those BIPOC communities by and large. So I have lots of other thoughts, but I'd love for Lindsay to, to jump in and um, because she does amazing work in this area. Well, thank you, Michelle. I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the information that you shared. I think it's really important to let people know that there, there's, there's a, there are a lot of resources and there's a lot of information out there. And I do feel that it is our charge to get the information to the people for sure. Um, I would say to add to what you said, Michelle, that you know, folks living in their own neighborhoods are the best subject matter experts for what is needed. Um, you mentioned earlier, Phil, there's a, and up until this point, there's been a lot of top down, top down, top down, top down, a lot of money, a lot of money, but not a lot of results. And so the idea with arm in arm is to organize individuals. Now that's not to exclude organizations, but again, understanding that people know what's best for their community. So I do wanna say that. Um, I would also say that I do feel that this is an opportunity, almost really like a civics 101. I mean, everybody knows you get the mail every day, but Sunday. Like that is like ingrained in all of our experiences. And I feel that even an opportunity to a small, um, even like an, an audit of like your election office of the way it's supposed to go and things to look out for. If this happens, you need to contact this person. Like, I feel like there are some systems and some processes that we can share with folks. So like, you know, this is how you can uh, maintain the integrity of, of your vote, of the election, is by holding your election office accountable. That's another way of going about it. And so there is a little bit of work going on in US CAN right now, um, you know, to, again, to begin pool, pooling those resources, that information, and to get it out to folks. So I'll just add that little piece. Well, thank you. I, and, and just I to just remind, wanted, oh, excuse yeah, me, go ahead. A couple things to add. I completely agreed. I mean, build on resources in your community do your own organizing. This is absolutely crucial. Um, and I do wanna add that there's a big need on election day in many states and communities for poll workers. Um, mm -hmm. And if we can get people there to keep those lines short. So for people who are super busy, um, think about taking November 3rd off and, and volunteering if you possibly can, even just half a day. Um, and you can go to um, powerthepolls.org to help sign up for that. Um, and then um, reporting problems at the polls on the day, um, 1-866-OUR-VOTE. It's the number of a nonpartisan national election protection organization. Um, and if you're voting in person, please stay in line, wear a mask, stay in line. So that's, well, that, uh, that's I just want to add that. Good advice. We want to, uh, I think uh, Megan is going to help us get on the screen at some point or in, in the chat section, just exactly what you said, Michelle, so people can know where they are. Because uh, something that is perhaps not as well known as it might be if we still taught civics in high school, <laughs> as we did in the old days, um, the, uh, is that it, the rules are set in each state. In almost, I think, virtually every state, it is bipartisan in nature that there are people on the election boards in your precinct from both political parties that are legitimate. Usually, by the way, that day of work is paid for for that. And there is a need for people to do that uh, kind of thing, which is what Michelle was uh, alluding to. But then there also need for people to be what we call poll watchers who help or who help people that are either frightened by this or need a sandwich if they end up having those outrageous lines that we saw in a few of the primaries. One of the good things is that much of the ugliness that we've heard about trying to suppress the vote, we know about now. And, and there is a massive, broad-scale organizational effort being done to make sure there is legal help at critical polling places, to make sure there are people that will help people get to the polls, to shepherd them through the lines, uh, and, and of course, to try to do it safely. And then also going back to the mailing. So I just, nobody's going to be on their own uh, in this process and they, and they surely, hopefully won't be frightened off by some of the ugly language that some people are using. 
not to mention any names. <laughs> well, let's turn to, uh, in a sense, um, is there a, a, a lot of people do say this business, well, my vote doesn't count or there's not much I can do. Or I think a more natural proposition is, well, I, I just am not the sort of person that can push other people or to do this or that. Uh, I don't know if you have any suggestions because we're all different in the way we approach this uh, kind of thing as to how we help people who uh, either lack the knowledge or they're legitimately frightened by this process or they just are extremely shy when it comes to getting engaged. Or there are people that clearly look on politics as it's so ugly that I'm not gonna participate in it. <laughs> Excuse me, all, <laughs> all of the above, folks. <laughs> yeah, and I appreciate the question, uh, Phil, because coming from, coming from as a Black woman in the South, I personally struggle with this idea of voter apathy. Um, the social contract has been broken. So to say people are just apathetic, I don't think really addresses what the real true issue is. People have bled, people have died. There is violence associated with voting. And so apathy, again, is an inadequate term, if you ask me. Um, I'll also say, give you another example. Um, in 2018, here in Georgia, uh, for our um, governor's race, there was a bus of senior black folks who some of which had driven them to a senior center, driven, driven themselves to a senior center. They were not residents of this place. They had all gone to this one location, all of free will. They got on a bus to go vote. Black voters matter. Someone got wind and called the cops, you know, and the sheriff showed up and said, y'all got to get off the bus. You can't go vote. So I'm just saying all that to say that, you know, it's important to keep people as safe as possible and understand that people at times are in danger, especially in places where they may have limited access to things like in a rural place. Um, there may be only so many poles, you may, you know, the, the electricity, the Wi-Fi may not be that well. I mean, there's so many, so many multi-layered things to it. And so I say all that to say is, is as we are regaining the social contract and flexing our civic muscles to continue asking questions and building solidarity with groups of people that you may not understand, but also do understand that we all want to go to the same place. Michelle, do you have anything to offer on that? I'm sure you do your work on it all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate the question and, and Lindsay's response. Um, and going back to sort of a, one part of your um, wonderful multifaceted question about, um, you know, people who um, have not had yet a lot of experience with communicating politically or maybe uncomfortable. And sometimes there's a huge safety issue. Certainly rural parts of Michigan, there are people I know who don't feel safe um, expressing even with a sign on their lawn, their political opinions. Um, but when people are ready to make those phone calls or to um, maybe someday once again, knock on doors, I, I really feel that keep, um, encouraging people to share their story, their climate story. Um, certainly when I was knocking doors for a county commission race in a rural district, it was very powerful to just say very briefly my story and people would so often respond with their own climate or environment story. You know, their farm field that had been flooded for three years and they had harvested no crops or the drought or, you know, the list, the, the pesticides from the local um, factory farm that was poisoning their well. So um, I think that's a, a place where people can start. And also when people understand what the, the message of this, so much of um, what's been talked about today, which is that actually their neighbors on climate environment are likely to be with them. Um, that this is not a Democrat, Republican, independent thing. Um, and that when we talk with people, they're much more likely to support candidates who are pro-climate after the conversation. Um, this is sort of a win-win for us um, if we can get out there and, and talk to people. Um, so just wanted to add that. And can I add oh, one more thing? Actually, sure. I, I wanted to share. Um, I had someone share with me, you know, I, I used to do a lot of voter registration work and issues education at the grassroots level. And I'm always learning what's the wrap. To your point, people have voted 
nothing has changed. And you really can't argue with folks after the last presidential election. Even the way our systems are set up, it's not really about the popular vote. And so one little anecdote that I got was like, you know, this is a long-term game. If you're trying to go from point A to point B, you have to get on a bus. You can't get on no bus because you won't get anywhere. So you got to get, get somewhere. So get on, get on a bus. I'll just say that. And, and the local elections matter and they can make a difference there. And also in the ballot initiatives related to climate that are on the ballot in four different states. So there. Well, that, that's <laughs> very important. I was going to focus this there too on that we have multiple offices up for election and some of them you can have a real impact on more than others uh, kind of thing. And you don't want to forget those. But we have a question from our uh, uh, audience and it, it goes to something that both of you sort of alluded to, and it is with young people, with sort of newcomers, or they're not necessarily newcomers, but who feel extremely strongly, like, for example, you got to have the Green New Deal. And they're disappointed if, if the advocacy is not out there on their issues. And, and, and many of the issues that Lindsay's talking about, that's been a, a, a problem for many years uh, kind of thing. What, what uh, you're going to repeat yourself here somewhat, what is the message that will help bring those people along? So, if not so, now, uh, when? What? If not now, when? 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 Yeah, and I, I think, um, First, I would, this really does get back to the ballot initiatives, but you know, find the race, find the issue, find the thing that resonates for you where you can make that fight. And there are a lot of them out there. And as was mentioned in an earlier session, you can make calls for a federal race in another state uh, for a congressional race. So, um, but also, you know, um, and if you, if you Google my political history, you'll know I, I, I have some sympathy for, for that point of view, but, um, at the federal level, um, so much can be done by taking, by a switch in who's in the White House. Um, there are executive actions that can happen in the first hundred days that can make an enormous difference. So um, if not now, when? And it, there is so much at stake and we can make huge progress and advocate for more progress if we make those changes at the federal, state, and local level. Would it be well, possible to share one more small thing? I just want to channel the room into the room. Thank you. Our community elder, Annie Laura. Annie Laura always says that this is really about humanity and the spirit of humanity. Um, you know, so this is a, like a spiritual warfare. And as, as tired as we are, as overwhelmed as we are, as scared, as sick as we are, just play your part. You play your part. You play your part. And together we can do this. Also, I, I think uh, probably among uh, many Black Americans, they have a far greater appreciation for the need for the vote because of the efforts historically to deprive them of the vote in this country. And, and there's no excuse in the white community, uh, pardon me for raising it in a black white situation, but for not voting, but there's a lot of folks that just don't vote at all. And when you don't vote, you are really making a choice. You are having an impact. Uh, it's not as if you're absolved of making a tough political choice or anything of the sorts. That is a choice when you do, do not exercise your civic uh, capacity to do that. Well, I think we're reaching uh, near our close, if I'm correct. Uh, uh, well, we have five minutes to go, so <laughs> good. Um, uh, and I've just lost my train of thought. <laughs> so Michelle, well, let's give Michelle and, and Lindsay a few minutes to say if they'd just like to wrap up a statement that I'm going to make a brief uh, wrap up to. Uh, so Michelle or Lindsay, take it away. Go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so I just want to let people know that there are opportunities to plug in um, with Arm in Arm. I shared this information um, with Amy a little bit earlier, so you all should have access to it. Um, but we've got a training for trainers. If you're someone who's interested in training people in your community around Arm in Arm and how we got to this socioeconomic political moment, um, 
there's a link for that and we'll get that to you. If you're interested in joining a regional conversation, you don't necessarily want to do anything yet, but you kind of want to see like the lay of the land, um, you can join a region. And we're asking people to sign the pledge. I should have said that first. Sign the arm in arm pledge. There are multiple ways, multiple things you can commit to. We're wanting to people to commit now, knowing that at some point we will be calling for a mass action of some sort. So getting people to commit now. Um, once you sign the pledge, you'll have access to be able to sign yourself to a region. Um, if you want to start a hub or join a hub, we've got 19 around the country right now. We've got links for that too. And, um, you know, if you want to make a donation, and we also have arm in arm merchandise, and that uh, also helps to support the movement. The opposition is not going to fund our revolution. We have to fund it ourselves. Um, yeah, thank you. I, it's just been such a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak on issues that are near and dear to my heart and that of the DNC um, Climate Crisis and Environmental Council. Um, I think what I'd like to close with is that um, we should, something that Lindsay alluded to, which is find the thing that you can do to make a difference and all of us can find something and then leverage that. You, whether it's within your community, whether it's within your organization, whether it's reaching out to existing organizations or calling uh, across state lines or within your own state for a candidate or for a ballot initiative. Um, and keep fighting. Um, we're gonna win this, but and we're gonna win it at all the levels, but no matter how it turns out, we're gonna go local, we're gonna go state, we're gonna keep building the movement um, because we see the climate crisis all around us. Um, and I think that's part of what's gonna help us keep winning. It's tragic, but true um, that climate denialism is actually you know, going away except for a few, few parts of the pe few people who tend to be on national TV. So we can't afford to wait any longer. Thank well, you for this opportunity to speak. I, I must say um, uh, for me, uh, both of you are an inspiration uh, and give me greater confidence in our future uh, because we have people taking up leadership uh, as you are doing and, and, and trying to engage as is so important so many other people. My own experience in running for office and politics was that for many, many citizens, they underestimate their ability to have an impact, then their power or the power of their vote or the power of their voice. And the voice, because television and whatnot and all this makes it look like you have to be a shouter or you have to be have a massive audience. The reality is that most of us trust the people we go to a church with, or we work with, or we're in our neighborhood, and we know which ones are not this, to have the same confidence in, uh, level of confidence. And so it goes to a point that Catherine Cahill, uh, a scientist, a, who, a self-professed Christian, uh, she was on our program here earlier, said, uh, speak up. And when we say speak up, it doesn't have to be loud. It's to neighbors, it's to families, it's to friends to remind them of the importance if they need information to help them. And the several uh, online things have been stated here and I just mentioned one additional one that Eco America has, it's called the Social Toolkit, uh, which is to help people uh, figure out ways that they can help organize uh, and we can make a difference. Many people, when they make speeches about this, political leaders, they often uh, refer to the great national purpose of going to the moon, which clearly was a, a technical and organizational achievement of first order uh, in this country. Uh, and, uh, and, and they would like to see us re-engage with that kind of national purpose. There are a couple of things about it that are really important to remember. One, first of all, we, we most of us finally learned about with that great movie, Hidden Figures, in which it told about the black mathematicians, women, of course, uh, who were so critical to make the calculations prior to having com computers that can make the calculations for how you <laughs> break out of the uh, gravity and whatnot, and, and the central role they played a role they played at a time in which they faced all the restrictions in Florida that were part of Jim Crow, not even what bathroom they could go to uh, kind of proposition. And yet 
they were central to the success of that mission. It was just a reminder of how these issues all interrelate uh, to each other. But the point I want to make about the, the effort to go to the moon was, while thousands of people made that happen, the vast majority of us, and I'm old enough to actually have seen it on television when it happened, I, I realize for most of you, this is ancient history, but, but who didn't uh, see it was most of us were just kibitzers. We had no role to play in it, nothing that we could do to make it happen or to work. And yet, and yet, here in this issue, this issue is not only going to affect all of our families, either now or in the future, but we can all do something. We can do something from the way we consume, the way we organize, the way we engage in the civic society, and the way we engage at the workplace. There is something we can do, and that can really add up. So I really hope that uh, people will join in, lock arm in arm, and, and make it happen, not just this fall, but after the election is over. So with that, I think we're going back to Bob. Thank you. Thank you so much.